Thank you, everybody. Um, we're just wanting to um, firstly start by acknowledging and paying respects to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community as a traditional and original owners and continuing custodians of this land on which I'm meeting today. I would also like to acknowledge the elders past and present and emerging and all um, of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, across Australia. Um, today, AdSet's excited to be bringing um, you the first webinar for 2019. I'm sorry it's taken us so long. It's um, been one of those things of trying to get the webinars um, off the ground is quite difficult, um, but hopefully this will be the first of um, many more to come in the next few months. Um, today's topic is a, fab to a fabulous topic. Um, we're starting, starting off with when is an adjustment reasonable in education? Um, and we're delighted to have Rick Bofa um, presenting um, with us today. This is um, Rick's first webinar, so um, he's new to the technology. Um, but Rick is probably no stranger to many of us online today. Um, and um, he's had a diverse career and he currently manages the RMIT Equitable Learning Services. You may have noticed that we are now using Zoom. Um, this was, um, this is for accessibility reasons, so we hope your experience of this webinar um, will be um, far easier to use than our previous platform. Um, so we're hoping everything will go um, okay. I've got every finger um, crossed in the hope that we will have no difficulties. For those wanting to access closed captions, we are having closed captions provided by Bradley Reporting. And you can access those at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can expand the caption box by clicking on the small arrow um, on the right hand side at the top of the box. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Um, you can't actually have any movement around the captioning, but you um, should be able to see the caption as well. If you are using captions today and would like to provide feedback on if it worked for you or not, please do, um, as we, the other option for us is to have captioning in a separate web browser going forward. Um, if you have any um, technical difficulties throughout the webinar, um, please email us on admin at adset.edu.au. Rick's aiming to do the presentation for around 40 or so minutes um, and then we'll have 10 or so minutes for questions at the end. Um, but Rick's also going to pose some questions to us throughout his presentation. We're going to try um, to actually allow people to put up their hand and if um, you have got a, a, a mic or feel that your sound will be good, we can actually... Um, have you asked the question into the, the webinar, if you're happy for your voice to be recorded. Um, otherwise, you can put your answers into the chat or question pods. And also throughout the presentation, if you come up with any questions you would like me to raise with Rick at the end of this webinar, please feel free to put them in those um, in either of those pods and we will ask, um, ask them. We are unsure which one's going to work best, the question or the chat pod at this stage, but we wanted to try both. Once again, we're just feeling our way of how this technology technology will work. Okay, I think I've covered off everything. I'm really hoping you um, yeah, um, join us for many more webinars um, this year. But for now, we're over to Rick and this webinar. Thank you, Rick. Great. Thanks very much, Darlene. Great to, great to be here. Um, yes, a, a disclaimer that uh, I'm not all that savvy with um, webinar technology, so please um, um, take it easy on me. Um, I'm still using um, uh, an abacus when I do my um, my budget calculations. So, uh, uh, but let's jump into it. Um, so, I'm I'm Rick Boffer, uh, manager of the Equitable Learning Services at RMIT, um, and I'm here to talk to you um, about you know, how to determine when an adjustment um, is in fact reasonable. And my objectives for this afternoon. Uh, to define the term reasonable adjustment, provide you with a simple formula to help you determine um, when an adjustment is reasonable or perhaps unreasonable, and provide some case studies for um, discussion. Um, and I'm not too sure how the discussion is going to work um, um, here this afternoon on the webinar, but um, let, let's give it a go and, and see. Um, 
where we get to. Okay, so definition. Um, what I tend to use as a definition is, is an adjustment considered reasonable if it balances the needs of all parties concerned. Um, pretty, pretty simple, um, and I'm sure those of you who are active uh, practitioners out there um, will, you know, have your own uh, variations to um, to this definition. Um, now, I, I, whenever, whenever I use that um, uh, definition, it, it's really important for me to be clear with the people I'm speaking to in terms of who the relevant parties are. Um, so if I can ask the question to uh, the audience out there, um, who do we think would be um, the key parties to, that are involved um, with most uh, reasonable adjustment discussions? So question out there, let's see what the responses are. So feel free to um, put the responses into the chat or question pod if you'd like, or raise your hand. So Rick, we've had a few answers like students with disabilities, students in class, academics, disability services, um, students. All who are attending or learning is another answer. Great. Well, well that, that's a pretty um, uh, comprehensive uh, response. Let's um, spin the wheel and see what comes up here. So we've got um, the institution, um, academics and teaching staff, other students, absolutely and a student with a disability, um, which, who, who are the, the, the reason why we're posing the, um, the questions in the first place, so absolutely. So they're the primary um, parties to any, any discussion around adjustments. So next is the formula. Um, and it is as follows. So I believe um, that a reasonable adjustment uh, equals the institution plus the staff plus other students and um, students with disabilities. So we've got um, all of those key players um, considered in, in any particular adjustment we want to uh, work through and that particular adjustment um, does not cause any adverse um, uh, influence or impact on any other stakeholder, then we, then we can um, safely say that that adjustment's reasonable um, and that would become a reasonable adjustment. However, if it impacts um, you know, negatively on, on any one of those parties, then we would... Um, consider that perhaps more discussion is needed because in its present form, that adjustment recommendation um, may not be considered um, reasonable. Um, and some case studies for, for discussion. Um, if, so for example, if we've got a student um, with a disability who's requested an alternative assessment arrangement or a AAA, instead of sitting formal exams. Um, this request uh, this, this request has been made at the end of um, semester during the formal exam period and the student wants it to apply immediately if possible. Um, is this reasonable? Um, so, so can I ask that question of, of the audience? What, what, what do you guys think? Is, is this reasonable? Um, and I think that for me, the, um, the important bits are that this is happening at the end of semester. Okay, everybody, if you wanted to put that into the question and answer, and sorry, you can't all see it. We've 
appeared to, um, the chat box seems to be disabled. So it's good, we might need to offer it some adjustments and accommodation to um, enable it to participate effectively. Um, mm. So, um, yeah, so if anybody wants to um, put some answers into the um, question and answer, and I'll read those out to Rick until we get, see if we can get the chat, the chat box going. Um, so some people have written it's time consuming, but it's possible to put in place, then it would be reasonable. Um, one person said this is not reasonable. No, not reasonable no. in the time frame given. Um, so reasonable adjustments takes time and effort. Um, so it could be have any negative impact on staff or some of the answers we've got at the moment, Rick. This is great. great. Thank you, everybody, for participating in um, in providing um, us all the um, your answers, and we'll um, collate them to get them to Rick because I can't read them all out, but to collate them to Rick. So without your names, just so he gets an idea of some of the answers. Terrific, and that, that that's wonderful. Thanks very much, um, Darlene. And and of, of course, the the chat box was um, disabled, so we could actually demonstrate a reasonable adjustment. So I think that went down well. What what do you think, uh, Darlene? Um, so it, yes, I just got text by someone saying it was a great joke, so I've done well. <laughs> uh, well done. Okay. Well, they're, they're great responses. Um, um, so let's just see what the um, uh, what the wheel tells us. Um, oh, gone backwards. Okay. So I, um, I normally start these conversations with with the depends because um, there there are so many variables involved. Um, but to be able to come up and say categorically, yeah, you know, instantly, you know, whether it's a yes or no, very hard to do. So um, um, be be optimistic. Um, uh, however, you know, given the the extreme late notice, um, it you know, to make to make a triple A adjustment an alternative assessment arrangement, it it does take a considerable amount of time because we're actually asking our academic um, um, colleagues to essentially change the way that they assess um, the the curriculum, um, and and that you know that's something that that uh, is a time consuming activity, um, particularly when they need to consider academic integrity. Um, so very very difficult. Um, so you know open open now to. Um, the, the audience. I mean, uh, you know, have have uh, has anybody out there had any great success um, with you know, organising uh, an alternative assessment arrangement uh, for a student at the eleventh hour? Um, if so, you know, are there any particular um, strategies or, or um, formats that you use in terms of um, you know, talking to academic colleagues? Um, yeah, any thoughts? Feel free to um, raise your hand also if you're um, um, wanting to talk into the webinar or yeah, keep your um, answers coming into the um, question pod. Yeah, I mean, if, if anybody uh, wants to use their their mic and, and um, have a bit of a chat, it'd be great to, to have a two-way um, conversation. Very happy to do that. Um, a couple of answers that are coming through. I would perhaps um, reschedule the assessment for the student. Um, yes, I would be able to adapt an existing past item. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, um, but if I had to think, um, yes, if I had to think quickly on my feet and be very inclusive with other participants, nothing at the 11th hour, but absolutely with a reasonable amount of time. If there were a present process for such a situation, I could be done on short notice. Otherwise, it would be too challenging. Um, it's a case, one person said it's a case by case, but we usually approach the academic with the request. Look, they're, they're all um, great responses. Um, and and I, I would agree with, with, with every single one of them. Certainly, the option of um, delaying or postponing the assessment um, it's certainly one that we've um, um, we've put forward in the RMIT context 
um, on on more than several occasions where this happens. Um, and, and generally, you know, academics and, and teaching staff are, are you know, very happy to engage in a conversation around this if there's sufficient time to do it. So, so postponing an assessment is certainly a, um, a great option. Um, certainly uh, in the RMIT context, we, we try and communicate um, key messages to students who are registered with us um, through the semester. Um, and one of those key messages is, the, you know, the, the earlier you can get in to talk to one of our advisors, um, but the more opportunity it, it allows the university to um, accommodate your um, particular needs because we've got more time to to do so. And 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 that, um, that that's typically working reasonably well for us because the the eleventh hour. Um, requests such as this that they, they do seem to be diminishing at a fairly significant uh, rate, which is great news for us. Um, the other thing that I'm really keen to um, to move forward on you know, at RMIT and, and open up a conversation with um, other institutions is around, you know, for me, um, you know, if we can eliminate the need to, to actually have conversations around alternative assessment arrangements. Um, whether they're timely or not, you know that would be a fantastic thing. And I guess what I'm, I'm um, you know, suggesting or hoping to, to move towards is where we have, um, you know, course course or program structured around um, a variety of assessment types, um, which would give um, students an opportunity to, you know, maybe choose which. Um, assessment tools actually you know, cater best to their, their, their way of learning. Um, and and you know, if, if we're able to sort of achieve that um, outcome, then we're, we're less uh, needing to you know, undertake um, you know, alternative assessment arrangements on an individual basis, um, if, that, if that makes sense. Um, um, any, any, any thoughts out there on, on that um, approach or any other and more inclusive, you know, teaching, um, teaching and learning styles that, that might sort of eliminate the need for individual adjustments such as this. All right, everybody. The a miraculous Jane Hawkeswood has got the chat box going, um, so you can actually um, put into the chat box um, your answers. But down the bottom, you just need to click on um, instead of. Um, to the panellists. Um, you just need to write all panellists and attendees and that gives a chance for everybody to, um, to be able to see it. Um, and so then that will keep the conversation going. So, um, and get other, if you want to participate, otherwise you can just send a um, question in the question box and um, I'll, um, I'll, I'll ask that to Rick. So Rick, your question again. Um, my, my question again, um uh, really, is is whether uh, you know people uh, agree with with the learning and teaching approach that may, maybe it would be a good idea to offer uh, more assessment um, uh, methods to all students, and therefore allowing students to make a choice as to which assessment type uh, best meets their their learning requirements. So really mainstreaming it uh, and making it um, more inclusive, um, or whether there's, there's, there's any other ideas, uh, innovative ideas out there with regards to how we can um, create a more inclusive curriculum um, and maybe um, you know, diminishing the need to, to have to make reasonable adjustments on an individual basis. Yep, brilliant. So we've had quite a number of um, chats in the chat pods. So people are saying that um, uh, one person has said that many academics are developing multiple assessments, which is once again gives students an opportunity of choice. Um, um, somebody else said it seemed to be something which is offered in gender and cultural studies. The academics have difficulty with this though, as it's hard to create a standardised way of marking. Um, Somebody said, have resources ready to go that provide reasonable adjustments ready for flexibility according to the type, place of assessment and individual students. 
Um, someone's written, yes, options are good, but must be writ within the requirements of the discipline or practice still. Yeah. Staff yeah. need the skills. Um, so, yeah, no, some great answers. Yeah. No, well, well, thank you very much, um, everyone, for, for that. Um, that. That's terrific. All right, well, look, we might move off this particular case study and, and um, look at the next one. Okay, so a student um, uh, with a disability has been assessed by a disability practitioner or advisor as requiring the following adjustments for their formal examination. Um, we've got, and I'm just missing some of it um, from my um, screen, but let's say uh, uh, an additional um, 10 minutes writing time, um, 10 minutes additional reading time, and 10 minutes per uh, hour rest breaks, a room on own, and a scribe. And simply, is this reasonable? So what do we think? Gosh, you're making me work hard today, Rick, and everybody else. <laughs> yeah, this is I normally, great. I normally, I normally sit back, got my feet up on my couch, but no. Oh, well. Well, well that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm, 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 this is great. I've actually got a, a, a martini just sitting beside my um, computer out of view. Um, this is terrific. I'll, I'll do one of these again. So um, the answers are um, depends on the disability, um, depends on the condition, depends on the exam. Um, some people said yes. Um, what would be the reason for a room on own with a scribe only? The rest um, seems reasonable. I think that it is reasonable as long as flexibility is applied for other participants. Depends on the impact of the condition. It seems reasonable. However, for total fairness, I think there should be an examiner in the room with the student and the scribe. Are there some of the answers? Great. And, and you know, they're, they're, they're all terrific responses, so thanks for those. Uh, look, absolutely, I, I think this is, this is very reasonable. Um, there's certainly nothing in there that's going to um, cause unjustifiable hardship for an institution or, or exam staff, um, particularly if all of this um, is, is um, provided to um, our exam administrators well ahead of time, and generally um, it is. Um, a room on own for, uh, and we'll assume um, for the purpose of this case study that um, the, the disability practitioner or, or advisor, um, they've, they've carefully assessed um, the student, so they've, they've taken on the, uh, the documentation provided by the student, so the um, objective information um, and, and verified um, that. They've spoken to the, the student and, and um, I've got a really good understanding of their story and challenges, so the subjective um, information. And then the disability practitioner or advisor, value add to all of that is that um, they uh, crunch that information or analyse it um, using their, their experience and their understanding of the, the institution's um, disability legislative obligations. Um, and they've come to um, to these to these recommendations, so I think we'll just assume that they they are um, appropriate to the students' needs. But I guess the, the main point that I wanted to make was, you know, just sort of you going back to the formula. Um, you know, is is there anything um, within these recommendations that are, are going to impact um, negatively on any of the other um, stakeholders? And I think um, you know, in this in this particular instance, no. Um, you know, we're, we've assessed the student um, thoroughly. So, um, you know, what has been recommended um, that the student's entitled to under the Disability Discrimination Act. Um, so therefore, we're, we're not advantaging um, the student. Uh, so in terms of other students, um, you know, it, it's an equitable process um, um, and, and fair in terms of um, um, academic and teaching staff, 
Um, there's nothing in there that's going to be overly onerous to them. They don't need to change uh, exam papers or anything like that. Um, the only uh, case where they might need to provide an additional exam paper, of course, is if um, this, you know, the student with a disabilities exam is perhaps happening at a different time um, to, their, um, to their peers. But generally speaking, with, with um, uh, recommendations such as these, um, you know, the, the, the student with a disability is doing their exam pretty much at the same time as, um, as their peers, so no problem there. Um, so yeah, um, I, I would, I would you know, be suggesting that um, you know, on the face of it, um, these particular recommendations in case study two are reasonable and we should be um, implementing them um, with bigger. And, and I think there was, there was a question, um, Darlene, that you know, someone was asking, you know, why would we have a room on own um, with the scribe, um, absolutely, a room on own um, um, is really um, uh, relevant and, and, and necessary for situations where a student does have a scribe, so they're, so they're um, um, you know, dictating their, their responses. So we want to make sure that they're not um, interrupting other students. Um, similarly, students who might be using, um, you know, voice dictation, you know, Dragon Naturally Speaking or something like that, um, we want to ensure that they're not um, disrupting other students, so room on own is quite appropriate. And yes, in, in most circumstances where we do have a room on own for academic integrity purposes, there would be um, an invigilator in the room. So in fact, there's actually three people in the room, but the student, the scribe um, and the invigilator. Um, yeah, so, so any, any uh, other comments or, or um, uh, triggers for the discussion that anyone wants to sort of raise? Um, so yeah. I uh, confirmed um, also, Chris, um, Rick, that um, you know, there may be also some sensory issues. So, you know, good to have the room as well on their yes. own. Yep. Yeah. Um, and also anxiety issues um, can lead to the own room as well. Absolutely, that there are a number of reasons as to why um, a room on own would would be um, a good thing, and 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 yeah. So in this example, we're talking about um, um, scenarios where, uh, because of the adjustment, it it might um, impact negatively on other students. So um, the students sitting on their own, um, as you mentioned, Darlene, that there'll be, um, there'll be lots of scenarios where just you know just the students going to function. Um, much better um, due to you know, anxiety and, and other um, challenges where they, they, they've got a space, um, that they're secluded, they're away from others um, and, and the, the potential pressures that uh, being with others creates for them. Um, Yeah, so, so are there any comments um, from anybody else out there? No, all good to go if you want to keep going. All good to go if you want to keep going. Okay, look, I think we're almost um, at the end of the, um, well, actually I've got some, um, we are, that was, that was very quick. Um, I must have forgotten to use one, of, one or two of my icebreakers at the beginning. <laughs> Okay, thanks for that, Rick. Um, yeah, I suppose um, Rick hasn't experienced the webinar, a webinar before, so probably um, wasn't aware that um, it's kind of not like a, a a room full of people and having conversations. So it's probably been a little bit disjointed for people having me read out the answers. Um, so, but it's probably given some people some opportunity to um, reflect on their own current practices. Have anybody got any um, general questions for Rick or any comment on the content? So there are a few more chats coming through. We're just waiting for those now. Great. Rick. Terrific. And, and darling, maybe, um, it, you know, while, while we're here and we've got really um, another 10, uh, 15 minutes if we, if we want to use them, um, I'm happy before uh, if there are any practitioners out there who are struggling with, with a particular challenge, 
um, um, you know, put it to me now um, and maybe we can um, have a bit of a, an innovative um, um, discussion around you know, how we might be able to solve it. Or at least okay, so Rick, um, I've got a couple of questions coming through. Do you actually run information sessions for academic, academic staff regarding adjustments? Um, yes, we do. Um, we, we try and um, target um, particular schools, and not, not for any bad reason, but just to sort of make sure that we're uh, methodically getting to, um, to everyone as well as on request. And, and that probably equates to uh, maybe a, about 10 to 15 um, sort of formal presentations um, a year. And that would sort of be roughly around about an hour and a half or two hours, which would consist of, um, um, you know, presentation and then sort of, you know, Q&A at the end. And, and that's a really useful, um, you know, means by... by, by identifying and creating relationships for um, um, discussions later down the track. Great. Um, someone said that um, earlier on um, you felt that the message of reporting um, needs to um, go out earlier, seems to be working because of these requests being less. What do you see as the most effective medium to deliver that message? Um, I think, well, at RMIT, we use um, a couple of uh, methods um, from the equitable learning service, my, my area. And one of them is that we, we send out uh, a message to um, new students who tick the disability box on their enrolment, um, which is you know, generally a, you know, a welcome. And, you know, please uh, find some services which you might be interested in and one of one of them of course is some um, equitable learning services the the other is um strategically placed um student announcements through the semester so we might do those um maybe three weeks into semester and maybe um, two or three weeks before semester's finished um and and that sort of tends to work reasonably well the other, um, we, we did a survey of our students um, late last year, and one of the questions was, you know, how did you find out about um, equitable learning services? And a real surprise to me, the majority of students found out about us uh, via um, discussion with their um, academics and teaching staff, uh, which is really lovely to, um, to read. Um, so obviously, you know, um, students and, and staff are having sort of proactive conversations early with regards to particular challenges and um, um, equitable learning services is sort of coming up as a, um, a viable um, option to sort of consider. Um, so those three things, I think, have um, worked really well in the RMIT context, um, yep, as well as you know, word of mouth. Okay, um, so a question um, for the group, but also to Rick. So if people do have answers in the chat pod for their colleagues, please feel to, um, free to have the chat going. Um, uh, students who cannot attend at um, classes due to their medical condition, um, this person's talking about a TAFE scenario where the mm -hmm. attendance is required around 80%. Um, what sort of adjustments would be reasonable um, so that the student is very the student is very motivated and wants to stay up to date with their work, but actually due to their condition, um, you know, may not be able to attend the required 80%. Mm. Um, that, that's a little bit tricky because it, it, it depends. It's one of my, my depends answers again. Um, we, we've got a, a, an adjustment recommendation around attendance where um, we, we sort of say, you know, due to the student's um, um, circumstances that they might um, experience, um, you know, short bouts of an inability to, to attend. Um, and we ask for uh, academics and teaching staff to provide some flexibility and I, I equate that to, you know, if uh, attendance requirements is around 80%, then 
a student with that particular adjustment in their equitable learning plan, which their academic will have a copy of, um, I, I would sort of, uh, be suggesting to that academic that um, you know that, that they, they apply some flexibility, which would be somewhere in the order of um, you know 70, 65 to seventy percent attendance. So they're dropping it by um, ten to fifteen percent, and they would do that based on. Um, the students' uh, participation in class, um, and you know, you know their, their their assessments um, that have been put in um, up up to that point, and that um, that that seems to be really uh, fairly well um, um, acknowledged at RMIT. We don't we don't tend to have a lot of um, difficulty there. The conversation with students. Uh, if they feel that you know their, their attendance, in fact, is going to be lower than sixty-five percent, um, then you know that that's a more um, proactive conversation with um, the student and their um, their school and and my my staff um, around you know what what are the potential alternatives that we can achieve um, to, to enable that to happen, and and the depends comes in with regards to, you know, what is the program that we're studying. So, for example, if it's a program where there's lots of prac, um, practical um, exercises and, and lab time and so on, then it's going to be really difficult to try and um, maintain academic integrity um, without the student putting in, um, you, know, uh, you know, that sort of time. So, so it really does depend, but I think the important thing is that um, we're, we're, we're able, you know, as practitioners, wherever we are, to surface the, um, um, the conversations with the relevant people and feel comfortable that we've explored all the options. Um, I think as practitioners, you know, that, that if we we're able to do that, then it's a job well done. Um, so the person's also um, said that there is a, um, a lot of role plan discussion involved in the class, which I suppose adds that extra challenge to yes. of the attendance. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think typically speaking, um, the attendance would be difficult to reduce for um, programs that, that have you know, the, um, strong work integrated learning or laboratory or, or practice nature to them yeah. for that reason. Now just another question, Rick, is um, someone's had a student that's requested a um, scribe with subject specific knowledge to be very, um, to a very high degree. Um, um, would this be considered a reasonable adjustment as they're having trouble sourcing scribes but can easily get scribes with subject general knowledge? Mm, that's a great question um, and it depends. Um, it, it, generally, generally speaking, so, so at, at RMIT, um, whenever um, we assess a student as requiring what we refer to as enabling staff, so that could be a note taker, a participation assistant, or an Auslan interpreter, um, we provide them with a, a, the student with an information pack, um, and that pack basically goes through how it works and um, and whatnot, and in there we deliberately. Uh, point out to students that you know, these enabling staff typically don't have um, subject specific knowledge. Um, they're great at what they do, but they don't. Uh, they're not experts in the um, the topic, and that's uh, by and large to um, safeguard the academic integrity um, and make sure that we're not um, providing an advantage to students because you know uh, um, the main the main goal of uh, of disability practitioners within tertiary study um, is that you know we, we want to level the playing field. Uh, we, we don't want to create um, um, you know advantages for um, students with disabilities because then we you know, obviously that's not equitable and academic integrity and so on and so forth. So um, now I said depends in my answer and that's because I think there are some exceptions to that and the exceptions would be where a student is studying a program where it's it's highly technical in nature, 
Um, and as such, um, it, it uses um, key phrases and words and formulas and whatnot that uh, would be very difficult for a lay person to be able to take notes on and um, relay um, um, in, in those circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we, we would um, discuss with um, academics and teaching staff um, the adjustment around using an enabling staff person who does actually have that um, uh, that knowledge. So, you know, the, the student's notes um, or their Auslan interpreter is actually communicating, you know, accurate information as opposed to, you know, giving them notes with um, everything sort of misspelled and um, out of context and so on. Um, so I think it is, it, it depends, and I think it is on a case-by-case -case basis. But generally speaking, no, the enabling staff would, would not have subject knowledge. Okay. Um, so just probably changing the tact a little bit here um, and asking a question around um, experience. I don't know if your equity unit, um, Rick, actually supports staff with disability as well. We've just had a question of, do you have any experience of staff with disability and how do you encourage them to come forward within the, your institution? Is that something that your service or does your HR support staff with disability? Well, that, that's a really um, good question. Um, at, at RMIT, um, you know, generally staff with disabilities would, would find out, would find their way um, to me and my, my unit um, before they would perhaps go to our HR. Um, so we've had lots of conversations with staff. Um, but, you know, the, the, their conversation, their, their advice, um, we would always need to refer staff back to HR. But um, in, the, in the last couple of years, um, we've, we've had some great discussions with our HR here um, and have developed a, um, uh, a work adjustments group or, or initiative at RMIT where um, staff with disabilities uh, are able to put in requests for um, reasonable adjustments. And this group um, of, of um, you know, well-trained professionals are able to action those um, requests. Um, and you know, more often than not, um, they're in discussions with, um, uh, with me and my, my staff um, and engaging with, with the expertise that we obviously have within the student um, space. Um, which is often, um, um, you know, also relevant in the staff space. Um, so, good question. Oh, that's great because it's um, someone's identified here that their experience um, for staff within their institution is very poor, um, and that often the staff that are doing the assessment don't have the skills or ability, and it's more of an, uh, an evaluation on the financial, not necessarily mm -hmm. what the adjustments are required. So, it's good to hear yeah, um, of RMIT's um, example. Yeah, look, and, and yeah, I mean, we're, we're slowly turning the tide on that. Um, you know, we've got some fantastic people at RMIT and in our HR, but, you know, I've got to say the, the um, you know, going back, you know, five, five or more years, um, staff were sort of saying, staff with disabilities who wanted to dis, uh, disclose, um, were saying to me that, um, you know, that the messages they were getting from um you know, HR and from from um, their institution were, were, were you know instantly sort of going towards the um, the managing risk or or OH and S, um, which is really disappointing. But you know, I can I can happily say that you know five years on, um, and I think we you know at RMIT we, we, we're on um, a great trajectory where you know the conversation is, is um, much more positive. Um, and it's about you know the, the individual being at the centre, um, and how can we assist uh, to assist and, and provide adjustments that are going to um, meet everybody's needs, um, and you know not go instantly towards um, you know risks and and you know how we're going to manage this. Um, so I, I think great um, strides there, and I think you know, that by and large due to you know, uh, disability practitioners like all of us, um, you know, continuing the, um, the conversation and, and having some really 
um, you know, positive and innovative influences on the institution for which we work. Yep, brilliant. Um, so just any final questions for Rick? Um, feel free to put your hand up just to challenge us one more, you know, in a little way today if, um, or um, and um, put the questions in the, um, the chat pod. Um, it's been great, Rick, seeing the, the questions come through. Um, I, we started this webinar not knowing how this would go and I think the, the, the conversation's been fantastic. One of the things that AdSet's been thinking about because I love to challenge us, is um, maybe developing some podcasts in the f in the future. And I just wonder if people um, just want to write in the chat pod if that's something that they would be interested in um, hearing. So, and probably along the lines of what Rick's done today was, you know, some Q&As of, of different practitioners and managers. Um, yeah, just about their experience. Because I think hearing from Rick today is really, um, I think, you know, it's great. We often work in isolation or in our little silos. And I think hearing from others within the sector about what's happening within their, um, their environment, um, yeah, serves us all well. Well, it looks like podcasts are going to happen because everybody's going, yes, great, wow. <laughs> now my heart's going 100 miles an hour. I don't know how to do it. But anyway, love learning new things. <laughs> Yeah. So any questions for Rick before we finish up? We've had a, a number of, um, you know, wonderful and thank you, um, Rick, for your presentation so far. Um, so I'll just... Yep, no other questions at this stage. Um, just to to um, to also say that the technology today seems to have worked fairly well. In um, we've had um, feedback from one of our participants who was a screen reader user who's been able to use the chat box really well and um, getting to have all your answers and questions read out. So that's fantastic feedback as well. So it, yeah, it looks like we've only got the excellence thank yous coming through, Rick. So. At this stage, I'll finish up. Um, just to give a heads up that we will be having um, more webinars and podcasts now um, going forward and um, we'll be putting those out, um, advertising those very soon. So thank you so much, Rick, um, for challenging me today with putting questions out, but um, also for giving up your time to share your wealth of knowledge experience um, with us. I'm um, Darlene, can, can I just close by saying, you know, thanks very much. This has been a, a wonderful experience um, and I really appreciate um, participants taking it easy on me. Um, and and you know, this, this is really difficult work and one of the reasons it, it is so difficult um, is that you know, uh, students with disabilities, people with disabilities, um, are not a homogenous group. Um, so their needs are uh, very different, very unique which means that we've got to keep coming up with um, innovative and creative um, solutions to often very challenging um, um, scenarios. So it's really important that we band together as a group. So I'm very happy. Um, Darlene, if you share my contact details, um, I'd be very happy to, to um, be contacted by anyone out there um, and have my thinking challenged and, and um, talk through you know, um, any scenarios that anyone might be working with and if we can add value um, by chatting, fantastic. So thank you very much, everyone. Great.